Hello, everyone. If you are just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be Does Civic Gov Tech Improve Democratic Government in Cities? I would like to welcome Joel to the virtual stage to introduce our next panel. Welcome, Joel. Okay, thank you, Callie. And it's great to be here. Uh, as Callie just said, uh, this is a discussion of uh, uh, whether digital tech, uh, by which we generally mean GovTech or CivTech, not, not, not the IoT, which also helps, but we're going to concentrate on tech around people, not things, uh, helps in realizing the democratic promise of cities. And we're concentrating on cities because that's where most people live. And, um, and we like cities. Just to define our terms a little bit at the outset, uh, by city, all we mean is uh, something that's uh, characterized by a dense, that is mutually proximate settlement of people from mega cities and mega regions uh, to much smaller ones. By the democratic promise of cities, what we mean is simply uh, democracy, that is constitutionalized self-rule with equal respect and access, equal access to means of, uh, of human flourishing in those cities which of course we recognize typically sit within much larger populations and jurisdictions. Maybe we'll get into that and, and the sorts of federal arrangements you need uh, in the discussion. The, the, uh, the background to this discussion is it was not so long ago that we often heard that uh, Internet of Things, especially when combined with smartly with digital uh, gov tech and civ tech, uh, would ease realization of that promise. Uh, cities could, as ever, as they have since uh, cities started, use their natural location efficiencies and the increasing returns uh, from their agglomerative combination of talents and physical capacities to get richer, uh, trading uh, profitably with others. They could get more equitable by sharing the fruits of productive contribution more fairly and by reducing the cost of meeting basic human needs, shelter, mobility, communication, education, healthcare, et cetera, that take a very, very large share of the household budgets of, of the poor. They get more sustainable by including natural capital in their ledgers of social wealth and, uh, and, and the productive contribution to that wealth. And that would minimize toxic, they could uh, make it uh, rational and rewarding to minimize toxic releases of all kinds and making much more efficient and restorative use of non-renewable nature. And they could get more democratic by uh, improving the allocative and dynamic efficiency uh, of, of government in meeting public demands. And what's more, this is really cool, they could enlist the public's local knowledge and cooperative will in effectively co-creating a variety of public goods appropriately and iteratively redesigned and, and um, to accommodate local circumstances. So the picture was a very nice picture, happy, flourishing, egalitarian, democratic cities. And tech could help in all those different things by dramatically reducing communication and transactions costs, optimizing the shared infrastructure that met those basic needs, and enabling better measurement of nearly everything, of government performance, of the public will, of policy feedback, and uh, as well, uh, eventually social progress. Now, I think, indeed I still have it, it's quite possible to have this clear, bright future of the promise of cities, while also recognizing and respecting the innumerable ways known to all of you that incumbent power, human ignorance, uh, and uh, ego fr uh, frustrate productive human cooperation. But it's also clear that uh, in general, looking across this, uh, this world, we're nowhere near uh, cities that fulfill that democratic promise. There, there are maybe some exceptions and maybe the, the discussions will bring those up, but what, what uh, for cities as a group of, uh, you know, human agglomerations, uh, they're nowhere near their democratic promise. So 
our question, continuing uh, other discussions this afternoon, including the panel that just ended, making democratic tools available to everyone, is basically how does digital tech, specifically gov and civic tech, again, dealing with people, not things, get us closer? I should emphasize, uh, just as a bid to reality, we, we only mean closer. We understand the gov and civ tech isn't the only nor likely the most important thing that's needed for democracy uh, in cities. But, but we certainly do need uh, some strategy on it since uh, it's now ubiquitous. Uh, often, of course, it has very bad, famously bad results. You know, the advertising model of for-profit social media at this point has a lot of blood on its hands in destroying a, uh, or enervating the democratic public sphere. But sometimes, uh, as we also know, it has very good ones. The same social media, indeed the for-profit social media, uh, has been has been the the chief tool used widely by the stirring anti-racism protests that are bubbling up uh, in the U.S. and around the world, and in the U.S. case may uh, actually point to a real birth of a uh, of a democratic nation of a sort that we've never had here. So we're all very high on the protests, and we all certainly think that Black Lives Matter, don't worry about that from this crowd, but, but, uh, but in thinking about uh, managing uh, social media and other civ tech and, and also managing the gov tech, um, uh, we think it's certainly a topic of continuing importance to think about its management and use more effectively for democratic ends. Anyway, so enough from me. Let's go to our distinguished group of people. What I'm going to do is ask, uh, and, and they're all experienced observers of the constantly interacting possibilities of, of, of uh, civ and gov tech and democracy. So to get us started, um, and we haven't uh, figured out which one's going to start, so I'll just pick on somebody. I want to ask each of you to take a few minutes, uh, you know, five to six, to introduce yourselves and tell us how you got involved in this uh, broad space, what exactly you do there, and what you see its contribution, your contribution to democracy to be. Of course, evidence is always welcome, but uh, bland assertions or <laughs> unjustified assertions are also permitted. So let's start with Michelle, who's at least smiling as I say that. Michelle, take it away. Oh, I'm, I am muted. Hello, and thank you so much. Uh, glad to be here today. Um, I started my career about 30 years ago. I was working at the University of Colorado in academia, actually um, trying to build a model um, using conjoint analysis to help Democrats and Republicans agree on what to do in Nicaragua. This is Iron Contra, so that kind of dates me, but you'll know during that time period. And I was all excited because I was getting all these folks to try to agree to a common ends and how we could find shared decision-making uh, landscape. Well, while I was working on this grant, uh, this, our grant funds were low for a few months. We were waiting for more federal grants to come in. So I decided to take a part-time job at the city of Boulder, Colorado, doing research. And it so happened on the same day, I first went and presented the results of my Iran Contra solving the world's problems, um, talked to a bunch of professors and students, and afterwards they clapped and you know, asked me what kind of statistical techniques I used. That night, I went to the city of Boulder, attended a council meeting, presented my results on a trash haul study, had 100 people participating. The city council right afterwards made it policy and changed and made the community better. So the next day I went and I told my boss who was uh, someone who had left academia for local government, I said, I can't imagine it. I said, I went to this, what I was doing such great work at noon. Then I went into the evening and talked about trash haul. And you know what? People cared a lot more about trash haul. And uh, jokingly, he said, Michelle, people care a lot more about how their trash gets emptied the world peace when it comes down to it and it was a joke but at the same time it became very meaningful to me and actually changed my life in terms of me deciding to stay with local government and decide to spend my time um, being in local government decision making because I felt like the results of what I did were more tangible and I could see it more easily um, not to say so anyways that's how I started my career I then stayed working for the city of Boulder seven years then helped form a company called National Research Center that does research and evaluation for local governments across the nation, mostly survey work, but all kinds of ways to bring resident and stakeholder opinions into government decision making and budgeting, performance measurement, planning, policy building. So that's what I've done for the last 25 years. A year ago, Polco, a digital engagement platform who does surveys and really works on crowdsourcing of local government opinion, 
um, a resident opinion, bought our company because my boss was retiring. And so um, I'm now uh, a senior researcher uh, for Polco, helping to deliver surveys on the web and trying to get folks still involved, businesses, residents, anyone, nonprofits into community decision-making. So I'm not as much into getting people to vote or get the right people in office as I am to working with people once they are in office to make sure they're still listening to residents. So that's my job. Um, and why I like what I do, besides the fact that I'm obviously like to help communities get better and change and improve, is that I really like the fact that I, through a survey work, have been able to really gauge residents in systematic ways and ways that we go out with surveys because the low burden of them and the way we are more, more representative in our outreach and the way we use the data, we've able to really been able to bring in voice into local democracy. It's not perfect, but we'll talk about more in this presentation, but I've always enjoyed my work and thought I've been doing a good job trying to make sure people who are harder to hear sometimes get involved. Now, when Polko purchased us, I was actually super excited because I knew like surveys and the work we were doing in the past was kind of becoming dinosaur or older. But I love the idea that technology made it so the Hey, Michelle, uh, you've gone, uh, we can't hear you anymore. No. Now we can hear you again. Sorry, I am posting from Crested Butte, Colorado, so I'm not sure my uh, signal will be great the whole time. Okay. We were yeah. warned by this, but we wanted Michelle a part of this, so we we gave in to nature and got <laughs> Michelle. Keep going. Sorry. Almost, so I don't know if you're, but I loved the idea that Polco, we merged them because I think through technology, we lower burden the burden of time. One of the things we know um, from surveys we do across the country is less than 20% in any community have ever attended a public meeting. And we know that actually, if you use technology, if people don't have to come for three hours on a Tuesday night it actually removes a lot of barriers that people have that are busy, that have kids, that don't have transportation, that work shift work. I love that about technology. The other thing I really love about it is it's less expensive. So it really helps local governments who don't are low resources or even community groups reach out. And then finally, I think it really often meets people where they're at. So many people, I know there's still a big digital divide, but we still have about 85% of people with smartphones. So actually meeting people where they are and not taking very much time is really a good way to get folks involved in government decision making. So for me, I'm super excited about the potential, but I still will talk about the problems that still arise. Okay, terrific. Amanda, you wanna go next? Sure, my name is Amanda Brink and I am a longtime uh, lefty political operative. Um, um, and I got involved in technology uh, in 2018, when I started working for an organization called Organizing Empowerment Project, we um, help organizations uh, run organizing programs and organize around the things that they would like to organize around. So sometimes that's around civic engagement. One of our most successful groups in 2019 was indeed about garbage, as Michelle pointed out earlier. It is a thing that riles everyone up and everyone cares about. Um, and so um, I've been in, in sort of the tech space for the last few years. Um, and really, you know, the, um, the thing that I think that Organizing Empowerment Project um, has really made an effort to do in a way that is different is, is that um, two thirds of the groups that we're working with um, are organizing in primarily either communities of color or they're organizing young folks. And so we see firsthand um, how the digital divide can really uh, be impactful in a community um, and how harmful it can be. And so while we do literally make an app for that, we also teach organizations how to organize without technology. Um, and so I think that um, as we've um, um, continued our um, continued our work and continued um, growing bigger and bigger. We serve a couple hundred organizations across the country uh, and help them with their work. We see more and more how technology can be pr profoundly helpful, um, but it also doesn't solve, you know, all of the problems that are out there. Um, and so with that, I'll turn it over to Mika. Okay, thank you. Hi. Uh, Mika Sifri, um, 
here in New York. Um, I run a nonprofit called Civic Hall, um, which has been around for five years um, as a community hub for the use of civic tech or technology for the public good. Uh, it grew out of a, a long running conference uh, that I and my partner, Andrew Shea, started back in 2004 called Personal Democracy Forum. Um, and um, I would say the thing that got me into this arena was uh, the potential for um, the internet, uh, the more open internet, not necessarily the one that we have now, but the one that we maybe had 15 years ago, um, pre-Facebook, et cetera, um, to uh, enable more people to have voice, um, to organize themselves effectively, to achieve uh, their own ends, and that it could be a democratizing tool. Um, uh, one thing I, uh, as I was thinking about uh, the session today, uh, and this question about cities and, and uh, tech um, is that over the last 15 years, we really have seen, um, and I've been involved in uh, this wave of uh, what you might call civic hackers, people who um, had the technology skills uh, maybe earlier than you know, the vast majority of people um, deciding that they would try and uh, improve life in their cities by using technology. Um, and a big piece of that was around uh, data, um, the opening up of government data uh, so that we could do more things with it. Um, so I'm hoping that, you know, as we get into the discussion that that one of the things we'll, we'll talk about is, you know, the, the, I guess, both the potential and the pitfalls of that. Um, but we are certainly well into, uh, you know, more than a full decade of, of people trying to use technology, not necessarily only with government, but sometimes aimed at trying to change government. Um, and, uh, you know, with mixed results. Um, but we have tried, at least with Civic Hall and with Personal Democracy Forum before that, uh, to put our thumb down uh, in supporting uh, people and organizations um, that were trying to. Uh, you know, absolutely work for a more democratic society. So good to be here. Okay, and good to have you. Uh, uh, let me ask you all a, a, a sort of a clearing the air question next, which is just tell me, tell all of us, what is it, uh, you know, what new technologies or apps or developments in the broader community that we're talking about? Again, GovCip, CivTech, I'll usually use CivTech, but let's include anything in government as well. Uh, do you find most uplifting right now? And, uh, and what do you find most deadening or dangerous? And, and think not just about the apps and the technologies, but the, the broader community, which we want to get at. Uh, and Mika, why, why don't we stick with you for a second? Could you take that question? Then we'll just work back. We'll do Amanda after that, and then we'll end with you, Michelle. So, um... This is not a particularly original thought to me. Um, uh, and in fact, there was a, a really terrific piece in the Wall Street Journal, I think yesterday uh, on this, but it's literally been 10 years since Steve Jobs said to his engineers, uh, let's see if we can put uh, the ability to capture video into the iPhone. Um, you know, the use of smartphones uh, to take pictures that was built from right into the first iPhones. But making it possible to capture video and then very easily share it, um, that came with the iPhone 3G, uh, uh, the iPhone 3. And um, here we are. Uh, the ability to record and distribute police misbehavior um, is at root uh, the basis for the entire revolution that's rolling through uh, that, I mean, the problem was there before, um, but being able to gather and spread the evidence and also to do it in a way that is outside of the control of um, commercial media. Um, I would say those two things are, you know, most profoundly uh, the most important. 
uh, in terms of you know power shift. Uh, the flip side is that you know demagogues uh, have absolutely figured out um, how to game the platforms for evil, um, and uh, you know whether it's here or in the Philippines or Brazil or Russia. Um, you know, we see this phenomenon of the platform strongman, um, who uh, partly because the, the big platforms like Facebook reward emotionally engaging content, not necessarily truthful content, um, that, that has become a tool for uh, the empowerment of de demagogues. Um, and so, you know, we're in both places at the same time. Okay, great. Amanda? I generally think that apps that are free uh, to use and can help bring people together are, are good and positive and um, are, are moving in the right direction. I think the uh, Facebook community rooms can be really interesting. And now that they're opening that up for free um, to more people can help bring people together, particularly in quarantine um, to you know help fight um, challenges with mental health and help bring people closer. I think WhatsApp can be used um uh has taken down some of the like barriers in allowing people to communicate with relatives who live in other countries similar to you know whatsapp um and and um other other things like that i, I do think that anything that is made can be used and weaponized right um and so if if that is you know uh, i i lifted up whatsapp but i'd also lift up wechat as being something that you know, a, a platform that was is is largely good and helps people communicate with their families, um, but also was turned into a toxic environment, pushing back against affirmative action in 2018. Um, and I think that so anything that you know is good and can be made to bring people together can also be used to divide folks apart. Um, and so we just really, really, really need to make sure that. Um, as we're building out our online communities that we're also building out like authentic connections um, and trusted messenger networks to um, kind of fight back against disinformation and individuals who are looking to weaponize um, software that and, and apps that are inherently made to bring people closer together. Yeah, both, both of you talked about particular apps um, and, the, and their misuse or appropriate use. Uh, but I want you to think, I want to get to Michelle, but I want the two of you to also think about the, the general community and how much it's sort of thinking about this stuff intelligently. I'll come back to you for that in a second. Uh, Michelle, but tell me what's most uplifting, either in terms of apps or, uh, or mo most editing, or, or uh, the question that your, your two previous colleagues sort of skipped over, the, the community itself. If, if there is any sort of digital civ tech or something community, the folks, Mika, that you gather regularly at City Hall. Oh, I want to know what you think about them or what, what's greatest about them, deadening about them, not just the use of the tools that they're talking about. Go ahead, Michelle, though. Oh, now, now you are officially muted. <laughs> I'm now you're on, all right. Sorry, I have a snoring dog next to me, so I don't, you guys don't know to hear him snore when I'm not on. Um, right. But, uh, you know, just thinking about tech and local governments in general, just the folks I work with all the time, the things that have helped them really from their perspective, not necessarily from our perspective, what works and how we want our you know world to look from government's perspective. I think they love anything that helps them save time, right? That hits pain points. So like any of the apps and technology we create, it should not just be like folks who set up t technology, I think just to be government watchdogs and actually are very adversarial towards local government. I'm not sure it ever works out for you that well. I feel like, um, the goal has to be positive and you have to figure out where local government needs help and develop ta tech that helps that. So a lot of the gov tech, like, you know, video cameras on stoplights, helping people figure out which way people are turning rather than have people count or putting public meeting votes online. Those things have worked because it helps local government save time so they can just focus their energy elsewhere. When we develop apps and tech that take actually more time from local government to work, or actually make government less representative. So you actually, for instance, in a lot of these digital online engagement tools, if it's not put out right, controlled right, or you know, set up in this thing, the same problem we had at the town meeting is a problem. You see the same, we always call them like the usual suspects, the frequent flyers who come to town meetings, and you hear from the same people over and over again. 
Well, if the way you set up your online engagement software, same way, those people now get on with a bigger megaphone. So what's happening in democracy, if you're not doing the right kinds of outreach to get all those people online, because sometimes those people who are already overrunning a local government decision-making process now have even more voice. And then they uh -huh. spread that and amplify it. So for me, it works, it could work and has great potential. But I also feel if you don't do the same kinds of concepts we have about democracy overall, if you're not reaching the right groups, you're not inviting the right people to the table, you're not making sure it's representative, those things are always gonna be a problem and it just becomes worse with tech. So we need to think from the perspective, I think of local government, if you wanna be someone who really serves government, not be so negative about them having negative, you know, intent, they have positive intent, figure out apps that will help them do their jobs better and help them make things more representative and not let the people who are already overriding local government get more voice. That's my. And for the broader civ tech community, what frustrates you about it? What, what delights you about it? Not, not the app, Michelle, but, but the, the broader community. So for the community at large, yeah, for me, yeah. Like, so the whole idea of putting technology into the community at large is we do lower burdens. We do meet a lot of people where they're at. It right. makes it easy to be candid and engaged. So all that's good if done right. Right, that's a good part of it. But there's nothing that frustrates you about this broader community. Or I can't get you guys to say anything about. Oh, what? No, it's why I, I, what frustrates me is the same people who are already overriding government now are also the people who learn how to use technology well. Uh, and I continue to megaphone out, you know, everything they want even more so to let yeah. the people who didn't have a voice have an even less of a voice. Does that make sense? I, I think that Silicon Valley generally thinks that they can invent a solution to just about anything. Thank um, you. Thank you. Someone said yeah. it. Okay. Thank you. So right. I think that Silicon Valley generally thinks that if they just make the perfect app or they just make the perfect piece of tech, that it will fix all of the problems without acknowledging the fact that something like 20% of white households don't have broadband and like 40% of um, black households don't have broadband. Um, and so like you need, ac you need access to the smartphone before you can, you know, get, before you can use the magic app. All right, so let's code that as arrogant techno utopianism or something. Uh, that'd be one thing that frustrates you. Anything else that frustrates you? You Amanda? like much bigger words than I do. Um, <laughs> uh, in general, in general, I think that. Um, I mean, that's one of the big things. I also think that there is a huge problem. We've talked a lot in the last like ten years about how women aren't women aren't software engineers and there's a gender divide in tech without acknowledging the racial divide in the folks who are actually making the tech um and i think um not acknowledging that and pretending it's not a problem is is manifesting itself in many 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 ways okay good and and, and mika these are your folks I, I know you find them lovable but there has to be something that frustrates you about them well, there are lots of things. I mean, first, just on the lovable side, I, I would say um, the best part is the the degree to which uh, people feel they have um, the freedom to invent, um, uh, especially younger people, uh, the sense of opportunity. I do not have to wait to work my way up through some you know, ancient bureaucratic organization, um, there is a lot of creative ferment. Um, and so the best part of this is, um, you know, the relatively speaking, a lower barrier to entry. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's the good part. The frustrating thing is, well, there are many frustrating things. The, you know, I will absolutely agree uh, with what Amanda said about uh, the way the, the field is stratified. Um, there is, uh, you know, a dearth of capital uh, going to uh, any kind of civic tech projects in the first place. And then secondly, in terms of women founders or people of color founders, um, you know, the, the VC, the, the way that VC money uh, drives development of tech uh, is really horrible. Um, there is an interesting movement called the zebras movement, which is a uh, counterpoint to the unicorns, you know, 
A unicorn is, uh, you know, the VC term for a startup that even before it goes public has a valuation of more than a billion dollars. Um, and in counterpoint to that, a group of women have uh, launched something called Zebras United, which is trying to build a different model uh, of a more sort of ethical, appropriate, um, balanced kind of tech development um, and, you know, to create a counter movement. Um, I would say that the, the civic tech field started with a certain amount of hubris. Um, it was typically uh, individual white male uh, geniuses who thought, uh, you know, that they on their own had the skills to hack a problem and, and you know, throw a solution out to the world. Um, and uh, sadly, uh, a lot of foundations uh, decided that that was great and put a lot of money into people like that too. It wasn't just VCs. Um, and so we have not had really equitable development in the field. Um, I would say it's really been uh, in the last four or five years uh, that there has been a kind of rethinking at the root of what's appropriate in terms of civic tech and you know who should do this and how. Um, and so we are starting to see more uh, uh, you know, you might call it community tech. I mean, a lot of this is just about labels. Yeah. Um, but I, I do think that um, the field is starting to mature uh, in a better direction. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a reflection of the larger society. You know, it isn't, it, I, we, we don't know, uh, but I would be surprised if the, you know, the same way that big capitalist tech is dominated by white boys uh, that VCs throw money at, uh, that would GovTech or civic tech be that much different? You know, at Civic Hall, we have always had, uh, uh, you know, from the beginning, I would say we were unusual in um, being roughly 50-50 male, female uh, in terms of membership, uh, which was great. Um, not nearly as good in terms of uh, people of color membership in New York City, and that is a reflection on me uh, and my co-founder. We're both white, and so the networks that we started with, we reproduced them. Yeah, uh, you know, we're working hard on on changing that, um, but it is it it doesn't change unless we're really conscious about it. Um, and I think that's the uh, the thing. Tech does not solve that problem <laughs> at all. Um, that you know that is a deeper human problem, um, and without deliberate action, uh, we will just reproduce ourselves. So um, that's a, a frustration to me is the way that the, the billionaires, the, you know, the Zuckerbergs and the Reed Hoffmans and the Bill Gates and, you know, the, the extent to which it is still largely, uh, you know, the money being invested um, is still mostly going uh, to really smart white men. Can I add to that just on terms of when you were talking about community, I thought you meant resident community. If you're talking about the tech community, the other thing I would say is I'm all for the diversity um, by ethnicity, gender, all the things. But the other thing I think the tech companies all lack is they lack actually people who've been in local government and have a, instead of being these technologists and people who are super smart and actually have never felt what it meant to be governing a community. I feel like there's a lack of absence and appreciation there because they get so frustrated then when they don't understand why people can't sign a check immediately or why they, why they don't like to hear of all this feedback all the time. And I think the lack of that, I mean, I give workshops where I ask all this, these are city managers, the people around America, do you know what a di data scientist is? Usually about 10 people out of 100 raise their hand. Like local government, it's not their job to be on top of technology. It's their job to street, you know, they sweep streets, they, you know, make parks. It's not their job. So we need to have it diverse group of people developing this software that's all different backgrounds but also let's include people that have done this job and know what it's like to run a community so that we under we have empathy for that right i want to i want to come back to the point you just made when we look at uh barriers to the diffusion of all these cool tools apps platforms etc that we've heard about throughout the conference but uh so i do want to come back to that as applied to you know governing a particular community. Um, but before we do that, I'd like to go a little bit deeper on 
what we're really aiming for here that, that was asked for in one of the previous panels, I think all what you guys are aiming for is a an informed, mindful, loving, you know, positive demos of of some kind, you know, a an informed people. Um, now, digital tech is fantastic at uh, reducing information costs. Um, uh, but of course, the cost of information or the accessibility of information is hardly the problem um, or the only problem uh, for that demos. Where do you guys see significant efforts by digital tech that are worth following or, or maybe even supporting in some way, in case there's any investor out there, that are aimed at improving information quality and collective discussion quality? Is there anything beyond, say, Lumio or, or other things that out there that people should be aware of? Um, well, I, you know, if, if I'll take that. You know, the there are other community engagement platforms um, being developed around the world. Decidim, uh, which is comes out of Spain, for example, uh, was actually developed uh, with the support of uh, the city government in Madrid. Uh, not the current government, but a previous administration that was really interested in, in uh, involving the public in a uh, in-depth kind of way in the development of policy and budgets. Um, and uh, the, you know, in, in Taiwan, there is a extensive process uh, called V-Taiwan, um, which the government uses uh, to engage the public around new difficult questions of policy uh, that use a variety of tools, including one called Polis, which I think Colin McGill was talking about on the previous panel that you were right. referring to. Right. So, um, you know, when there's a local government um, that's really interested in thickening, you know, uh, popular participation, uh, there is a suite of other tools available. Uh, Lumio certainly would be one uh, that, you know, is more designed to work for smaller groups, not necessarily, you know, thousands of participants. Um, but it comes back to, you know, really whether uh, the people in power are interested right. uh, in this kind of engagement or not. Um, the technology doesn't make them interested. Uh, it's more first, you know, is there really a demand and a desire both from the public as well as the, you know, the people in power um, to really uh, involve everyone in a serious way and give them a way to actually have a say. Um, all the experiments in simply making it easier for the public to address their, uh, uh, you know, the folks in power typically don't work um, on their own. Uh, you know, increasing voice uh, does not lead to uh, changes unless your voice comes with some teeth attached to it. Um, that can really force, uh, you know, the the system to respond. When the system wants to respond, that's a whole different thing. Right. Okay. Uh, Amanda or Michelle, you want to comment on that? I often wonder if there is like just a fundamental disconnect between um, talking about it in a way that actually, if if it if the fundamental disconnect isn't just like talking about issues in the way that people actually understand them, right? The difference between like, you know, again, going back to Michelle's garbage collection at, uh, at the beginning of this, like, you know, uh, let's talk about climate change. Let's talk about, you know, all of these things that sound big and don't really impact me and don't impact my household versus the garbage can that comes to the end of the street and how often they're going to pick up my recycling, et cetera, et cetera. And that's actually one of the things that I think is super cool about local government is it's you know, not not that the federal government doesn't impact our lives because it does, but like local government is more tangible in like fixing the pothole, getting the garbage picked up, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so sometimes I wonder if like these big platforms that we talk about and like how they can be su super interesting and in, like bringing more people into the process, we don't make the issues sound like they actually impact people. And we try to have these like big 10,000 foot discussions. Sometimes I think that it can, make people feel like it isn't for them because it doesn't really impact them. And we need to kind of um, talk about things in a way where folks can, you know, really actually understand them, you know? Um, and I think sometimes that can bring more people to the table. 
So assume that you have at your disposal the world's software engineering community. Are, are, is there some technology, some app, some, some bit of code that you would like to have them write that you don't think is out there right now that you need in order to, you know, either the communication stuff, improve the communication, in, in, increase uh, people's buy-in in decisions in the way you were just talking about, make it more concrete or, or, or not? Is there, is there something lacking in all, the, all these tech things that, that you can identify? I mean, if you're asking me if I had like a pot of cash to, to fix some problems, I would take it and put it into um, internet access and actually making um, actually making tech more available to for chunks of the population who it's not currently available to. That's what right. I would So simply it. that, not new tools, but access to the existing tools is where you put your money. Yeah, I mean, there's like 50 right. million kids who we've just like, you know, they're now learning from home, but a quarter of them don't have internet access. Like that's, okay. that's crazy. All right, so the digital divide thing again. And uh, Michelle, uh, uh, Mika, how, how would you guys uh, answer that ridiculous question? You know, if you had a gazillion bucks or whatever, what is the app or the technology that you'd be looking for and or the major distributional change in, in access to those tools uh, in, in, the, in the sense that Amanda was just talking about that you'd like uh, to see to improve the tech contribution to democracy? You, I can tell you my dream, which is what I'm trying to do right now. Um, but it's always been our goal at National Research. Like, I love surveys because they take people five to 10 minutes to complete. They can be anonymous. Um, you can hit people multiple times. So there's repeated feedback, but it's really a low cost for folks because people are, are busy. They don't trust those things. But the whole problem was how do you, once you get someone to talk to you over time? And so the platform I work with now, Polco, we try to build panels, but it's not perfect. But our goal is to just like, you know, you built, if we could get everybody's email addresses, first we have to address the digital divide, of course. But if we can get even everybody in the community somehow engaged with local government where you say, just spend five minutes a month with us. We're gonna send you a question five minutes a month. We're gonna make it low literacy, very easy to answer, make it relevant to you. And we're gonna ask you for your feedback. And then after we do that, we're gonna send you information back on how we use that data. Because we know like from our surveys, 50% of local government people don't feel like the, rec the local government welcomes their response. So if they feel like people care and they're doing something with it, then we also have money to work not on technology, but work with all those groups that represent diverse re groups that don't come to the table and talk to those people about how is it that we reach your people? And can you give this platform or this communication process legitimacy and trust? Work with those folks as true genuine partners in getting them to have their folks participate with this platform. And so again, monthly, weekly, five minutes, 10 minutes, you tap into the residents, stakeholders, they give you back, government feeds back how they use the information. That's my goal for how we get more democracy in. But again, there's partnerships, there's trust to be built, and there's just um, a lack of inclusivity about how we get those people to the table. But we have to make it low burden, we have to make it low literacy, we have to make it in multiple languages, we have to do all those things. So it's, those are in the platform and outside the platform. Uh, okay, and again, talking about the broader community, do you, do you think it's getting better uh, uh, in any way in, in recognizing you know, the incredible dangers of, you know, around security or privacy or, uh, you know, the, the tribalism, the, uh, and, you know, it's wild abuse or, or, uh, or not? What's your bottom line on that? I mean, I don't think, well, forget what I think. What's your guys' view about the, the mindfulness and, uh, and uh, you know, self, you know, self limitations of this community at this point? Are you pretty unimpressed or do you think it's actually making significant gains in, in good behavior? Joel, are you asking if, about the, the tech community or you're asking about the just the overall how users of tech uh, the tech community itself i'm talking about the tech community the people that you said you know were too dominated still by venture capitalists and yeah. billionaires the, those people know i i mean look uh at, at this particular moment in time you know uh 
I mean, the, the, there are some interesting things happening inside some of the big tech companies where their workers are kind of going, wait a second, this is really this, the kind of world changing I wanted to be, uh, right. you know, contributing to. Um, and so those folks, I think, uh, have some potential uh, either to exit or, you know, to put pressure on their bosses um, or maybe even to unionize and, and you know, uh, formally uh, try and, and shift how, how some of those companies work. But, you know, if Amazon, Google, uh, Facebook, um, these are, you know, uh, the new, you know, barons of our time. <laughs> Um, it, you know, compared to the railroad barons and the oil barons of, you know, a century or so ago. Um, and uh, at the particular moment that we're in, you know, t big tech, capital B, capital T, uh, is only getting more powerful at the moment um, because we're so dependent on it. Um, right. It could be, uh, you know, you 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 said if I had a gazillion dollars, well, how about if I, if I get to have the government that I want, um, rather than the gazillion dollars? Uh, you know, we could we could decide um, that some of these platforms are actually just utilities, um, and that uh, you know, as Amanda said, number one, we should guarantee that everybody has access to high speed broadband. Um, you know, uh, in the 1930s. Uh, a, a part of the New Deal was rural electrification, right? right. Um, getting, you know, farmers connected to electricity. And by the time that FDR died, nine out of 10 farmers in America were finally connected to the grid. Um, we should be doing the same thing for broadband, and both for the urban poor that can't afford the, the ridiculously overpriced broadband that the duopoly providers currently are able to charge right. or in rural areas. Um, I mean, that's just like fundamental. And by the way, the cost of, uh, you know, getting broadband to everyone has been estimated at maybe somewhere between 40 and $80 billion. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that, you know, we've already shoveled out multiples of that uh, in, the, in the recent, uh, you know, COVID, emergency funding. So the money is there. It's a question of organizing political will um, and you know, realizing that uh, this is just like a basic need. Um, and in the case of Facebook, for example, you know, every, we all would love to get off of it, um, but it, it has locked everyone in, in the sense that it's like the phone book. Um, you know, the, the, the usefulness of it um, uh, uh, is, very hard to extract yourself from. Right. And so, you know, what we have to instead say is, okay, fine, it's, we need to have a social network, but it needs to be governed democratically by us. And that's what I mean by, you know, treat it like a utility um, and put it under very strict regulation. And, you know, sure, you get a modest return if you deliver the services the way right. you Fair enough. Okay. Uh, I, I've gotten my three minute warning here and we've got two questions and I'm going to give you guys the impossible task if you choose to answer any or both of these questions and then also give me your last remarks. Uh, one question is how could civic tech be scaled from cities to national or supranational levels or even the whole world? What do you think about citizen assemblies? That seems like two separate things, but whatever. And the other is, is there a model for raising money for civ tech startups that combines nonprofit commitments to the public good with flexibility of raising money to scale? So take either of those questions or ignore them, but give me your closing remarks. Um, Amanda, starting with you. I don't know that I have anything on those two questions. I will just parrot what Mika was saying. Like as a Wisconsin-based political operative, uh, if I were going to rent an office in Milwaukee, Wisconsin for a campaign, my first question would be, uh, can I get internet there in, in, a, in the middle of an American urban city? That's right. a big city and that shouldn't happen. All right, so let's go to the back, the basic public good of co uh, communication access for all. Uh, Michelle. 
You're muted again. Yeah. Okay. No, now, now you muted yourself again on uh, inadvertently. Oh, now, you're, now you're unmuted. Okay, good. I'm also not, I'm not an expert in the last two questions you asked. Mika might be better at that. I would just say that my goal is what I said earlier, which is whatever we choose has to be low burden, low literacy. Um, people are busy, people do. And we also have to have legitimate relationships with you know, communities of color, people of lower income, people who traditionally have not been a voice in local government. Until we can partner with those communities in a better way, in an authentic way, we're not gonna get democracy. Okay, fair enough. Mika, bring us home. Sure. Uh, so what, 30 seconds or so. 30 seconds. I would just say uh, a, a global online assembly makes no sense to me. Uh, I, I, I'd like to see the UN work better <laughs> as, as a starting point. Um, uh, and secondly, on the question of uh, funding, um, yes, the, the, there are people trying to develop platform co-ops. The cooperative model is a, a live and thriving in many places, and it's worth trying to do in uh, civic tech development as well. Um, the problem, again, is that uh, there is a competition for talent, uh, and the VCs drive up uh, those costs and they expect a big return on their investment and so it skews things in an un unhealthy direction. So it would be great if we had public investment funds available to support the development of civic tech and in many cases a lot of this at the end of the day you know should be done by government right, um, right. We, you know nobody says let's set up our voting system on a private platform right that is just a public service it ought to be provided better than it's currently provided. And we should think of digital democracy kinds of tools as things that should be public services as well. Fair enough. Well, let me thank uh, all three of you, uh, Michelle Kobayashi, Amanda Brink, and Mika Sifri. Uh, thanks a lot. It was, I enjoyed the discussion. I hope the rest of you listening did. Thanks. Thanks all. Bye-bye.